Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, a project of the Unpopulist. Reimagining Liberty is a show about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. I'm your host, Aaron Ross Powell. This is a podcast about liberalism, but liberalism is a bit of a contested term, slippery, evolving, and claimed by lots of people with rather diverse views about what it means. My guest offers a helpful framework for clarifying what liberalism is by dividing it into what she calls the four corners of liberalism, related and overlapping but still distinct approaches to the liberal idea. Emily Chamley Wright, the president and CEO of the Institute for Humane Studies, has made a career of defending the liberal tradition, and her insights in our conversation help clarify what liberalism is and how we should approach and respond to those who would seek to overturn it. You have made the case that there are actually four kinds of liberalism or four approaches or four corners as you describe it. Let's talk through those because I think this is a really interesting framework for approaching questions of liberalism, the tension within liberalism, and the ways that people who are not themselves liberals think about this whole Mm -hmm. liberal project. So what are they? Yeah, so let me say first that the um, what I have in mind is that it's a single liberalism, a single liberal project, um, but that it has four dimensions to it. And the four dimensions are political liberalism, economic liberalism, intellectual liberalism, and cultural liberalism. And uh, in the in the broadest broadest brush strokes, the political liberalism project is. You know, what's captured within uh, founding era documents, uh, Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights, this, uh, you know, constitutional separations of powers, constrained uh, government that is intended to secure our rights, these, and secure individual liberties. That's the political liberalism project that most, most Americans are familiar with um, from their um, you know, civics, their K-12 civics education. Uh, and that's what's most familiar to us when we, when we, dis- when we think about the liberal project. Uh, the next corner would be the economic liberalism, and this is the piece that that classical liberals, uh, um, you know, want to focus in on is that political liberalism and political freedom is is of course incredibly important, and so is economic freedom. It is the elbow room that allows us to try things out, to innovate, to also um, feel the consequences of bad decisions, uh, and that and that. In the process of that of that um, openness, that economic openness, we learn as individuals, but we also learn as a society as well. So that's perhaps something we can tap into a little bit. Uh, but moving to the third corner is intellectual liberalism. This is the um, the approach to inquiry that says openness is the best way for us to uh, gain an understanding of truth. It allows us to discover new things. It allows us to um, rid ourselves of false beliefs. It allows us to open up um, our best ideas to scrutiny and improve them. And uh, you know, sort of the John Stuart Mill kind of project. Um, it captures well the epistemic or intellectual liberalism piece. And the fourth corner is, is cultural liberalism, that sense of openness, that that default towards openness, that so long as you and I are respecting one another's rights and the rights of other people, we can let one another um, pursue the project uh, on our own uh, to discover what um, the good life means and what that means for us and recognizing that that we're very unlike that it's that in many cases we won't come to the same conclusions but as long as we're respecting one another, one another's liberties, individual liberties, then um, then we should have an, a sense of openness and experimentation. Um, we should have a sense, a default sense of toleration uh, that that allows for this kind of cultural experimentation uh, and growth and change and recognizing that that your choices along these along these lines don't harm me. And the the sort of really, really upside the you know the stronger upside version of cultural liberalism is that, in that process that begins with a kind of perhaps cold t- 
toleration, we come to learn that we can live and coexist side by side. And in fact, we can um, engage in trade relationships, neighborly interactions, civil, we can, we can be with one another within civil society and, and, you know, all is well. And that toleration can then eventually emerge into a healthy pluralism. Let me start by asking then, because there's a lot to unpack in all of that. Uh, let me start by asking about political liberalism and and the relationship within political liberalism between ends and institutional means. Because I think we've we have seen this come up in the last several years in the in the rhetoric, the way that that more mainstream liberals talk about and defend liberalism and push back on on some of the critiques of it. And I'll give a I'll give a version like a an encapsulation of I think the the crux of this this tension, which was I remember when the the January 6th riot insurrection was happening. And I was online as many of us were and I was on Twitter as many of us were following all of this. And I found it this shocking and appalling action, this assault on an attempt to overthrow the liberal order and so on. But then there were a lot of people who who typically see themselves as you know advocates of of robust freedom who are like, actually, this is just fine because what they're doing is like we've been against like Congress does all sorts of bad things. We've wanted to reform it. We've wanted to, you know, like radically change government in pro-freedom ways. And so why are you defending this calcified institution in the first place, right? And and there's that – so that tension of is our commitment as political liberals to the ends of – in in the way that you put it in one of the articles talking about this, um, individuals having the room to pursue their preferences and plans – or is it to maintaining the institutions that we have said are are representative of political liberalism and and specifically how do we resolve the tension of those institutions can be broadly liberal but can then have significant problems that push in an illiberal direction but robust critique of them can get read as this is a danger to to the system itself right that that we might, if we, if we are too critical of the institutions on the grounds that they push potentially in illiberal directions, we risk delegitimizing the system, lowering social trust in ways that are going to promote not more freedom, not more liberalism in the way that you and I understand it, but less. And so almost like kind of keep your criticisms to yourself sort of argument. And I just I, – I frequently think about that tension of basically calling out the problems, which I think is – you know, like there are genuine problems, but not then kind of giving fuel to the people who just want to tear the whole system down to replace it with something worse. Yeah. So I think that there's an, an error, just an error in thinking uh, that uh, the project to um, – the project to generate greater freedom has nothing to do with institutions, right? I think that that's just a that's a, a, a an error in one's analysis of the way the world works. That institutions are bound up with um, uh, what kind of social order emerges. So if there's if so, there may be in some of these critiques a kind of wishful thinking that they want maximal freedom. But without having to think through the very hard question of what institutional rules of the game and institutional structures need to be in place to secure those freedoms, um, and and that's where the liberal project becomes um, you know becomes a a an intellectual pro uh, project as well as a kind of civic project of work of how do we work it all out. Um, so. I just don't quite know how to correct the error if someone's point of view is uh, that institutions don't matter because it's it's uh, I, I think the burden of proof would be on them. Uh, so if if we start from the place that says institutions do matter, 
uh, what, you know, how are we going to, what are the rules of the game that are going to allow us to govern ourselves um, as, as free people? Then we are in the kind of um, a game that James Buchanan is in, which is to understand the rules of the game, also understand how they can work towards uh, liberal ends and towards um, generating greater um, a, a greater peace, greater level of social peace and prosperity. And also the ways in which those ins- those very same institutions can degrade, right? Um, so that that is, I think, a, a, a way to, to kind of um, hone our where we're sitting in the conversation. So to criticize the way in which institutions, political institutions, are operating on the ground is not to say that is not to suggest that then let's uh, tear the whole system down. It's to critique the ways in which people have um, have co-opted their access to and uh, access to power or the power that they hold in a way that is actually counterproductive if what our goal is is social peace and prosperity and uh, maximal liberty for all individuals. So those that's the place I would begin, but I'm not sure if that if that's the the right direct. I want to pause here to see if that is a productive direction to start taking the conversation. Yes, I think that gets to or addresses this this critique that I see. I think that the broader issue is that when we are like, as you as you rightly point out like liberalism is this is like an ongoing project and it's and it's one of it's one of dynamism. So it is one that embraces a a constant set of a, a constant progress through change, and and that, that that change comes about through economic dynamism. It comes about through cultural dynamism. It comes about through your the epistemic liberalism is basically a a knowledge dynamism of we're in this ongoing constant project to refine, expand our knowledge, which means being willing to toss away things that we thought at one time were true, but now no longer appear to be, and so on. So there's a willingness to embrace change. But when it comes to political liberalism, um, particularly in, in the Trump era, because Trumpism seemed so focused on tearing down and hobbling the institutions of of our society, which was in many ways broadly liberal, but also had particularly, you know, had illiberal aspects to it and so on. Um, there was this this reaction against basically critiquing institutions along along liberal grounds. And so you end up with like the weird thing of suddenly Democrats were like defenders of the FBI and the CIA, which in the past they had seen as like, you know, tools of of an illiberal society that was doing all sorts of awful things and and so that that particular critique of basically like in a time of threats to liberty don't don't rock the boat in terms of critique and in terms of uh, critiquing the existing institutions but instead merely defend them against the people who would replace them with something worse and I wonder about that in terms of the underlying, like, real dynamism of liberalism, which says we ultimately have to embrace change. And so, how do we how do we embrace that dynamism without kind of risking hurting the the wildly imperfect institutions that are enabling whatever level of liberalism we already have? Yeah. So I think that. It might be helpful to bring in here um, a point I like to make about the broader liberal sensibility that especially in the political um, in in political liberalism, it is a, a significant emphasis on institutional rules of the game and institutional structures like an independent judiciary, um, like the free press, like uh, uh, you know, cons- uh, equality before the law, the 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 um, uh, the constraints on government, 
so that it does not overreach. Uh, those institutional rules of the game are matched with norms, you know, uh, norms that uphold them. So um, while it certainly is reasonable for a political leader to um, uh, challenge, you know, a journalist who set who who is circulating um, uh, factually incorrect uh, journalism is, you know, journalism that is cr critical of the government. I, you know, this is this is. I think fair game for a, uh, an elected official to, you know, push back against that. There's a very different thing than pushing back against a particular piece and still recognize what the the um, point of a free press is and undermining the the credibility of the free press altogether, or dismiss or calling or um, calling for sanctions that would um, punish journalists for criticizing the government. That's, those are, these are two totally different things. I think we just have to be mature enough as, as this is part of what the responsibility is as to being um, uh, self-governing citizens is that we have to know the difference between those two things that it's that, and, and I think that there's a similar, a similar um, uh, role to play or a similar kind of move we can make when uh, we can criticize uh, a particular a Supreme Court decision, for example, without tearing down the institution of the independent judiciary. And that those two, that that line of distinction is one where uh, it's up to us as citizens of a liberal democratic order to understand that that difference. And this is this is where, you know, education matters. This is where this is where things like civic education around what the liberal order, the liberal political order is supposed to do. Um, and then recognize that the whole point of the thinking of, of um, James Madison, uh, the whole point of needing these rules in place is because we are imperfect human beings. If we were angels, we wouldn't need government, right? And, uh, and the challenge is how do we establish rules of the game? How do we establish political institutions that are um, that are designed to protect our liberties, but that also means putting power in the hands of a, of a particular group of people. How do we make sure that that's constrained appropriately? That's never going to be a perfect, that's never going to be a perfect system. That's just not the nature of the beast. So, uh, so understanding the, the variations of imperfection is an important piece of what it means to be a, um, an edu edu a, a citizenry that's educated uh, for the freedom that we have. And I think that's that's a really important point and one that I'm curious to, to dig into a bit in terms of <clears throat> rising illiberalism because ultimately – so I've, I have sometimes remarked there's that show that some of our listeners may remember called The West Wing, which was about a Democratic – president and his his administration and president i president bartlett had, i believe president bartlett yes um and i had remarked at one point that you couldn't have a like radically classical liberal west wing or radically libertarian west wing because it would be a really boring show because the president every episode would be Bartlett's in his office. Someone comes in and is like, here's a problem I've identified in society, the economy. And Bartlett would say, well, we're not going to do anything. We're going to like, government's going to stay out of this. And then through emergent processes, things are going to, are going to solve. So they would, there wouldn't be a show. Right. And, and that, that gets to that kind of imperfection. I think that you're talking about, which is core to really embracing a liberal society is saying there are going to be things in the world that you wish were different, that you wish you wish society looked like this, or you wish that the economy wasn't shifting in a way that was putting these people out of work, um, or you wish that culture wasn't going in a direction that you don't like, um, or you wish that these particular social problems were solved now instead of tomorrow or a decade from now or so on. But for all of these reasons, you need to you need to put up with it. 
you need to wait. You need to accept the imperfection in your mind. And I say in your mind because it might be that the imperfections you've identified aren't actually imperfections. They might just be like your own personal preferences that others don't share or whatever. But you need to just kind of accept that. And and it seems to me that a lot of the illiberalism that we're seeing today is people rejecting that like weight that that ref, that liberal refusal to use these t- these powerful tools that the government has to immediately affect the kind of change that they want and sometimes sometimes it's like good to just say like the change you want is bad right like the, there's a good reason we don't want you to do it the change you want is bad like you don't like that gay people have more social freedoms than they used to you want to change that like it's your ends are wrong in that regard. But there are other times when we look at people like actually like pointing to real, you know, there are, there is actually poverty or there's actually like profound inequalities or there are actually people who are hurting right now and we are telling them, yes, the, this person's saying they can use the tools of the state to like give you a solution right now, but in the long run or even in the short run, like that's a bad because it cuts against liberalism. It, you know, like getting what you want isn't worth it, basically. Um, and so how do we as as liberals, as people who want to, who advocate for, want to promote, want to maintain a liberal society, make the case for liberalism in that context, like make the case to people who are actually genuinely hurting from the imperfections and say to them, like, no, it's not worth it to use this tool that's sitting there right in front of you and is calling to you, you know, like that power could be wielded, but you shouldn't wield it. Yeah, and this is where the um, the political economy project is is important for us to um, see the wholeness of it. Uh, that if we if and it's the problem of sitting in one corner of the liberal project and not kind of seeing and recognizing the other three corners. Um, and we we could maybe draw parallels to intellectual and cultural liberalism here. But you know, for a second, let's talk about the connections between political liberalism and economic liberalism. So. Um, the um, the project of economic liberalism is ultimately a project that if we had one defining virtue that we could ascribe to it when it's at its best uh, uh, is humility. And this is, I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about what are the virtues of the liberal order and, and, winnowing them down so that it's not just, well, what's the laundry list of things that Emily likes and, you know, wishes the world could look like this, right? And that's the world I want to live in and and then insist that they're all essential pieces of the liberal project. Uh, And in that discipline of winnowing down to like, what what are core virtues of the liberal order? Humility has stood the test, right? Um, uh, In my mind. And so um, the political apparatus of the liberal order can it can identify it it perhaps it it can identify ends that w- that many of us perhaps not all of us but many of us would say yeah that would be a good end right to sh- to shoot for so assuming we're all in agreement on the end that that uh, we want to achieve now we have to talk about the means of achieving that end what's the how behind it and. And what's the likelihood that in exercising the means that we have at our disposal that we'll actually achieve the end that we're all focused on? So a lot of times the fights be- amongst liberals themselves, but uh, amongst um, uh, critics of liberalism and liberals is uh, is not a fight about the end, right? You know, it's it's more about how are we going to pursue it? And so... If, we, if the end is to eliminate poverty, the, um, the problem is so big, so complex, that the political impulses in a lot of us is to, is to say, well, let's have a, an engineered solution from the top down. And the economic liberal says, 
whoa, wait a minute, right? First of all, how are you going to do that without violating the political liber- liberties that you say you, that you're in favor of? So that's one that's one uh, kind of uh, critique and challenge. Uh, but another one is that in exercising the uncontested power and authority that you will have to exercise to uh, achieve some sort of global end like this, you're assuming that you've got the machinery that is going to allow you to achieve that end as if you knew better than the system itself that the the alternative system the alternative system is an open marketplace that allows for lots and lots of experimentation entrepreneurship um uh pursuit of opportunities many of which fail that and then people learn out of that trial and error process and they you know revise their plans they try again and it's through that tugging and pulling of the market process that emerges the massive system of cooperation and coordination that tends to, over time, be the only thing that lifts people out of poverty. And this, uh, and and so, if we are going to uh, override and crush the very system that generates prosperity, you're not going to achieve the end that, that we all agreed was a good end, right? But if the mechanism that you're going to deploy is to, dis- is, is to eradicate the very discovery process that generates growth and prosperity in the first place, that's what I mean by we, there is a, within the liberal political economy, there's an embedded humility. Right. It's that understanding that we are very limited in our ability to achieve ends from the standpoint of a Zeus, right, from the standpoint of an all knowing, all powerful deity that sort of stands up and and apart from society. Uh, First of all, that, you know, let's assume that that doesn't exist because it doesn't. Right. It, and then we've got to recognize that the political actors are not sitting up on Mount Olympus. They're right here on the ground with the rest of us. They don't ha- have um, either omniscience or omnipotence, right? They're very limited in what they can know. And, and they're limited, even given the power that they have, the power to control for all the unintended consequences that come from the public policy that they would pursue. They can't wrestle those down to the ground. And and t- and tame the um, the forces of those unintended consequences, and so this is, I think, an important piece of how it's an example of how the four corners of the liberal project work as a system with each other. So, in other words, you can have uh, liberal political rules of the game and have democratic processes, but if you don't have economic liberalism, right, you're not going to get the outcomes of social peace and prosperity that the liberal project you know, is is promising to uh, uh, to generate. So these two um, these two corners work both in tandem with one another and also they're they're sort of in tension with one another, but in a positive way. What role does specifically cultural liberalism? play in this? Because obviously cultural liberalism is, you know, going back to your, the way that you talked about political liberalism, you say it's, you know, the the goal is there is that we have the ability to pursue our plans and preferences. And that's squarely within like what cultural liberalism is, is, is cultural liberalism is simply a system where everyone is kind of free to pursue their preferences and plans, um, even if it's different you know, even if it's wildly diverse and it's not at all the same set of preferences as the guy down the street or the guy across the country. Um, but it seems like a lot of the illiberalism that we are facing right now isn't isn't about people wanting to scale back economic liberalism, right? Specifically, um, it's not really about the political institutions those are all like the rejection of those and even the rejection of of epistemic liberalism the those all seem to be like downstream effects of 
ultimately a rejection of cultural liberalism or a sense that the the dynamism, the cultural dynamism has gone either too far or it hasn't gone far enough, right? And so on the on the kind of cult, like cultural reactionary right, the the rejection of political liberalism and the rejection of uh, of economic liberalism are because they are enabling the wokeification of culture, the the so sudden tolerance of lifestyles that I find distasteful, the uh, the kind of tearing apart of certain traditional ways of living that were preferences. And so we need to attack these things as causes of that. On the left, it seems like a lot of the illiberalism is this, the the dynamism of, or the, the tolerance that comes with dynamism. So the acceptance of all of these alternate ways of living isn't happening fast enough, or there are people out there who have not themselves accepted it. And so we need to now attack political liberalism and economic liberalism in order to punish them or force faster change. You know, so we need the institutions of the state to compel people to have a certain set of beliefs or to keep certain sets of beliefs out of the, the conversational sphere or, you know, the, the bake shop owner who's not going to bake a cake for a gay wedding. We need to rein in his political or his economic liberalism his, his economic freedom in order to compel him to kind of go along with the cultural dynamism. Um, and so I'm curious about why, why it seems like cultural liberalism is suddenly the main driver of so much of this. Whereas in the past, what we saw was like the old, the old left, the kind of socialist, like communist movements were about economic liberalism is bad because it's not producing for the working class, right? Or political liberalism is bad because it's enabling certain kinds of economic systems that we don't like. Uh, but suddenly it seems to be cultural. So am I, am I misreading that? And if I'm not, like, what is, what's going on now in that regard? That's a good question. I want to get to it, but I want to flag something you said early, early on, and challenge a bit and see if you, you're, you're, uh, if we're in agreement or or a disagreement because it might be a, an answer, an answer to your to your question. Um, earlier in this thread, you 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 said that you know it doesn't seem like the real challenge around liberalism is about economic liberalism or political liberalism. I would push back on that, right? I would, I would, you know, if, if, if for example, the, uh, the, um, uh, that there is a norm, a set of norms that, uh, suggests that no matter what, what I might've thought about the last election, if I didn't get, if I didn't win the vote, once I exhaust all of my, um, sort of formal opportunities to, um, uh, to challenge the outcome that, that it's expected of me to be in a position uh, that defers to the uh, peaceful transition of power, that I that I play that ceremonial role, no matter um, how much uh, I might not like to, that doesn't matter. So it, it it's a liberal default. It's a liberal sensibility that one respects the outcome of free elections, and this being undermined, I think, is a, is a real challenge to political liberalism. Economic liberalism, I think, is also under uh, a significant challenge with um, a push towards economic nationalism that it's very difficult to distinguish between um, far left and far right economic nationalism, except for the players that they would leave in control of the, of the uh, levers of, of the state apparatus to control uh, you know, big swaths of the of the of the economy. So I do think that there is a real threat. But then, but it's not. But I, I am wondering, uh, like you, whether or not there is a link to then the cultural illiberalism that we're seeing. Right. So let me just let me clarify real quick because I think I yes, and so I think I I phrased what I was saying poorly. So what I I wasn't I wasn't making the case that there aren't genuine threats to political liberalism or economic liberalism or that, and I wasn't making the case or, or 
claiming that people are not have not become increasingly skeptical of political and economic liberalism. Rather, what I was saying is it seems like they're the reason that they are rejecting political liberalism and the reason that they're turning against economic liberalism. So the the rights, the American right conservatives increasing turn against free markets, it seems like the the core motivating factor behind those is a objection to cultural liberalism. So Trumpism, which led to the election denialism and so on, was largely an anti-cultural liberalism movement, and and it continues to be. Like DeSantis is this hero to the right because he is using the tools of the state to push back on cultural liberalism and and assaulting political liberalism and economic liberalism as a way to accomplish that. Uh, And so it seems like of the four liberalisms, three of them are – being rejected now because people are so motivated by either rejecting cultural liberalism or wanting it to happen faster than it is. Yeah. So I think that we, I think we're talking ourselves into an answer to our own question, which is uh, perhaps, and and I, I think this, um, you know, throw it out there, but then see what you think, and we should we should challenge it. Right? Is is that um, if if what I want to do is to galvanize a movement on either end of the um, either extreme of the uh, political spectrum, it's so much easier to tap into people's tribalism than to tap into, uh, you know, an economic critique about the way in which um, global patterns of, of economic trade um, you know, play out in the American um, uh, workforce. That's hard, right? That's that's hard to make that argument. It's hard to. Uh, it, it's it's not likely that people are going to have the sort of bandwidth and attention to um, take it up and to really wrestle with it and and then internalize it. But if you can just tap into the sort of tribal, this group over here represents an existential threat to you and your kind, right? That that's that taps into something that's that's primordial. It taps into a sort of um, a pre-liberal tribal ethos that's frankly just easier, right? And so that's the lowest hanging fruit. And and in a and in a sense, then what you get is this dynamic where uh, in the cultural uh, liberalism terrain, as opposed to say economic liberalism. Like I said, in economic liberalism, you know, both extremes look really, really similar to what they're advocating, right? Uh, whereas within the um, uh, cultural terrain, it looks as if they're advocating the um, uh, sort of extremes on the far left and the far right. It looks as though they're advocating something quite different because they're championing different groups, um, you know, who's been the most victimized, et, et, et cetera. The the key, though, is that they are still grasping for the same solution, which is more power, right, to whichever group they're identifying as, as um, you know, in need of remediation the most. And then the challenge is that, that once you adopt power as your means for remediation, the elites of any of either group are going to be the ones who are going to uh, seize power. And the outcomes are not are not going to be what you intended in all likelihood. Uh, but in that process, you get the sort of co-creation of extremism on one side, co-creates extreme, extremism and, and, and response on the other side. So we have a sort of spiral, spiraling out effect with cultural tribalism kind of moves within these various um, social movements. You have a sort of spinning out of control and it and it and it. It, it sort of saps the um, uh, sort of liberal sense of the, the liberal, I don't want to say middle as if it's uh, unprincipled, but a sort of, you know, middle common ground of, of you know, a liberal ethos. It might be right of center, it might be left of center, uh, but, but broadly speaking, in line with the, with the liberal project, it, it has a, a kind of tugging and pulling away from that that common ground of of the liberal project. What do you think? Is that is that 
the right analysis, that it's just simply a, that the cultural illiberalism that we're seeing is, is just simply a sort of tool of the elites that um, are used in a kind of cynical way? Yes, but I don't think it explains all of it. Um, and, and so I think that the, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't function as an effective tool if there weren't already serious worries about cultural liberalism among the people the elites are seeking money and votes from. Um, and so if, if everyone was mostly cool with cultural liberalism, then the demagogue trying to stir people up over there's cultural change, things are different than the way they used to be, you know, your group is no longer as dominant and so on, wouldn't find as much purchase. And so it does seem like something in, in the culture and polity has shifted to enable the, the demagogues to better, I guess, catalyze this tool into something that they can use to promote illiberalism. Um, so, so yes, I think you're 100% right that saying like, it's, it is harder to stir people up on the, the international trade and so on, or as I see sometimes people like on the, the far progressive left get very upset when they say like the working class is voting against its own interests when it you know embraces certain things and it's like well that's because for them the their their purely economic gain is not their only interest right and so there's there's other things that can that can trumpet in you know if if particularly triggered or fired up or so on and and so i wonder in the longer term um because you're the leader of an organization that exists to not just keep genuinely liberal ideas alive, but to attempt to make them more and more central to our society and and help to bring our society and our politics and our economy more in line with those those core principles. And that's a that's a long-term project. You know, it would be nice if we could win that tomorrow, but we're we're not going to. That's a long-term project. Um, and it does seem like Something has changed in the last 10, however many years, to make those ideas, so all four of the kinds of liberalism that you talk about, more under threat than it feels like they have been in a while. And I don't want to, I want I don't want to say this, like I should, I should clarify. This doesn't mean that like we had a utopia of liberalism. Before and I don't I don't want to be one of those people who like makes the case that like the 19th century was the high water mark of freedom because the government was small and wasn't involved in the economy and then obviously like there were lots of things going on in the 19th century where lots of people were radically unfree and we don't want to dismiss that or we don't want to dismiss the experience of people even in the last 20 years who lived under really there was real oppression on them, but they get overlooked because they're marginalized groups. Like that's really important to acknowledge that. But it does seem like something has changed and that 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 the the trajectory we were on has shifted in a illiberal direction. And so given given everything that we have talked about in the last 40 minutes, what do you see has changed? And what can we as liberals do about it? What's changed, I want to begin with just that that uh, acknowledgement that the ground has shifted, or maybe the metaphor is the, the sort of common ground it used to be, uh, you know, in, in the course of my lifetime and growing up in the United States and uh, um, what was what was the default that everyone was trying to get to? What was the default assumption? The default assumption was that it was some version of the liberal order was, was what good looked like. And it was all, it, and so it served as a kind of, um, you know, con a common framework for uh, how we knew where we were going. It wasn't, it wasn't as though, as you point out, that we had achieved um, the, the promise uh, that the liberal project um, uh, puts out in front of us. It wasn't that we had achieved it. It was instead that there was a sort of uh, a sense that 
when we got up in the morning and our, you know, feet met the ground, what they were meeting was a kind of like common ground of, uh, you know, basic liberal principles and that that was not, that wasn't in contestation. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't contested ground. It was just sort of the assumed thing that was going to keep you, uh, keep you upright. And what's changed is um, that there is a kind of erosion of that common ground. And that erosion has come from both extremes of the ideological spectrum. And at the same time, the where, where I think of as being the um, the majority of of um, Americans, the majority, I think, of people who pay attention to um, you know circumstances in the world of what of of what uh, a better world would look like. Most people are liberals. You know, if you, it wouldn't it wouldn't um, if you were to say you know should there broadly be. Uh, political liberties should people be um, uh, secure in their in their body and possessions uh, against predation of their fellow citizens and from the state. You know, I think that you you would get most people saying, "Yeah, that sounds like a pretty good that sounds like a pretty good plan." Um, the so the extremes of uh, illiberalism that we're seeing, I don't think, is a majority. Of human beings, I think, but I think that there is a sort of loud shr uh, a, a shrillness and a and a um, volume that is that has a corrosive effect, despite the fact that it's not the majority, right? Um, and so, the corrosive effect comes in the form, I think, of people putting out their version of of the better the better world, whatever that. Maybe right, and it might be um, some very illiberal view of the world on the right or, or on the left. But the willingness to suspend liberal principles to say liberalism in this case, I'm willing to do away with it because it's far better to achieve these ends, and I'm willing to use power and authority and top-down control to achieve those ends. And there was a time when figures, intellectual figures, political figures making that move were pariahs, right? And that we could point to them and say, that's a dictator, right? That's someone who we would want to resist. And there was a common understanding uh, that, that, that that power principle would be something to resist. And that's shift. That's shifted, right? Now, I think that there's a sense in which to be sophisticated is to say, oh, but wait a minute, you know, uh, you're just m making a case for liberalism for me, but not for thee. So uh, that and so there's a kind of uh, sophistication, um, you know, turn there that that makes use of the power principle an authoritarian principle as like acceptable and okay, right? And and I, and that's seen on both the left and the right. And that's and that's what's concerning. And so there's a way in which the use of power, look, it's like you say, it's always been there, right? Um but but from the standpoint of of sitting in a generally liberal democratic society, there was once a standpoint that that would that that you could be the umpire and say, no, 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 that's out of bounds because that's using an author authoritarian power to um, uh, to undermine individual liberties, to undermine the functioning of a liberal democratic society. That's out of bounds. That sort of rule of the game, that sort of out of bounds uh, ness of that call, that's what's crumbled. And it's crumbled, as I said, on on both ends of the ideological spectrum, and that's what's troubling. And so, the, and then, and then you get going back to that sort of like co-creation of the extremes. Extremism on one end co-creates the extremism on the other end, because well, we have to respond with these highly illiberal responses because of the of the craziness on the other side, and that's that's where that's the moment that we're in, and in that process that seeds 
ground to this use of power and authority, that's what's different in this moment than, say, even 10 years ago. So what do we do about that as as people committed to a a robust liberalism in the political sphere, in the social sphere, in the economic sphere, given that this is it's what you're describing is an arms race effectively how do we get out of that before it ends up in somewhere i mean things have not been great but they could be a lot worse and how do we stop it from getting to there i think the first thing we need to do as advocates of liberalism is to remind ourselves frequently over and over again what the point is and in very, very broad brushstrokes, the point is that we're pursuing liberalism, the liberal project, because that is what leads to social peace and cooperation. And so, you know, I would say that there's two major prongs there. One is that as advocates of liberalism, we need to do the mental work of identifying and understanding and then articulating uh, to all our various uh, audiences, uh, what are the institutions that lead to social peace and cooperation, and which in then in turn lead to widespread human flourishing and widely shared prosperity? The institutional piece is critical, and I think that that's where sort of the intellectual piece of the project is. And then, but paired with that is is what I call you know cultivating the liberal sensibility. These are the liberal norms that we have to articulate so that we can be aware of when and it's necessary to reclaim those liberal norms. So, you know, it might be in political spaces, like we talked about, you know, uh, the peaceful trans transition of power is not just an institutional question, it's also a norm question, right? Uh, norms of toleration in cultural spaces. But it's it's those baseline norms, but also the far more expansive norms that liberal institutions make possible, because that's where we create spaces for civil society. We create spaces for an expansive uh, notion of cultural liberalism, uh, you know, where we have a radical commitment to the dignity that, you know, we are one another's dignified equals. And so it's it's not just that we have a political system that supports human dignity. We want that, of course. But in addition to that, we need to be also articulating uh, a vision, what you know, James Buchanan called a vision for the liberal project, which you know includes, you know, when we're thinking about human dignity, it's it's that it's not just the rules of the game, but it's also how we treat each other and how we talk to each other. And I think then finally is is the thing that we need to do as advocates of liberalism is we need to be really wrestling with complex challenges, you know, where the stakes are really high, um, the, the challenge may be new to us, right, uh, and the answers are not obvious. We need to be willing to go into that terrain where we may not feel uh, com completely comfortable because we don't know what the solution is, but be willing to enter into those spaces with humility, with good faith and intellectual openness. And then I would say, and then our job as liberals is when we hear our, our friends, our, our co-workers, our uh, political representatives defaulting towards, because of the complexity, because of the bigness of the challenge, defaulting towards power and authority we need to be the ones who say, stop, wait, let's remind ourselves that it's better to start with the default of liberty as opposed to a default of power, right? Because then the search party goes searching for solutions that will respect individual liberty, that will respect the principles that underlie uh, the liberal project because we're starting with the default that liberty is better than power. If we can find the liberty-based, freedom-enhancing solution, that's what we want to go for. So we need to start with the, with the right default that liberty is a better place to 
end up, if we can get there, in our project of governing a complex world together as, as uh, self-governing citizens, if we start with that default of liberty over power, that I think is a principal role of an advocate of, of true liberalism, as you and I have been talking about. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you enjoy this show, please take a moment to rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. You can also join our Discord listener community and book club by following the link in the show notes. Reimagining Liberty is a project of the Unpopulist and is produced by Landry Ayers. 